Okay, we have an online question. Are non-Jews obligated to keep the seven Noahide laws? And if they are, how are they supposed to know that they're obligated to keep them? And how are they supposed to know what they are? Well, the, the nation of the world, every person in the world has to keep the seven Noahide laws. How will we know when the Messiah comes? How will we know? Yeah. Uh, it says, it says in the in the Rambam, Shibud Malchiot Puvad, and that means that uh, when the kingship returns to Israel, and that there's no practically it means when militarily and politically Israel is secure. Then we'll Building the third temple, uh, everybody then everybody will prosper because this is what the temple is for, <laughs> for the whole world. So you think that there could be some union between all the religions as Absolutely. part of Absolutely. We already have union, unity, but everybody's afraid from the terrorists. So this is our job to unify everybody to worship the only true living God uh, in the third temple with all the nations, all the nations that will worship God. The Messiah will be the judge. The, the, the Mashiach will be the judge and not for what he sees and not for what he hears, but what he smells. You believe the Mashiach Ben David is, is coming is, to, to this temple? Mashiach Ben David is very soon and he is a Jew and it is, he is not Jesus. And uh, if the Christians want to hold it, they can hold it. But we will never change our mind. We prefer to go back to Auschwitz and not to change our religion. This is the main thing. We are loyal. What would happen to Christians who refuse this Messiah and, and hold on to Jesus? Is that what we'll see? We'll we will see. I don't know. I'm not the Messiah. <laughs>
ונשלים את שבע מצוות בעולם. זה תפקידו של מלך המשיח בין השאר, שהוא לא בא רק כמשיח, אלא הוא בא לקיים את המצוות הללו. הוא יכבוש עיר אחת, שם שומרים שבע מצוות. יכבוש את עיראק, את טורקיה, יגיע גם לאיראן, ישליט בכל המקומות האלה את שבע מצוות בני נוח. אבל הוא ישליט זה לא במשפטים, אלא במלחמה. במלחמה, במלחמה צריכה להיות, לא דווקא להרוג, אלא להפך. הוא אומר להם, אני קורא לכם לשלום, אז אם מרים את הדגל, אומרים מעכשיו אין נצרות, אין אסלאם, המסגדים והצריכים של הנוצרים, הצדדים יורדים, מעכשיו בשורים של המצרותינו. זה תפקידו של מלך המשיח, להביא את העולם כולו למציאות של שבע מצוות. אז זה לא עניין למשפטים, זה עניין לביצוע, פשוט לא כמו שאומרים. ולכן, אני אומר, אולי הדברים האלה לא כל כך, לא כל כך נעימים לאוזן, אבל בשביל זה, שאם אתה פוגש בן אדם ברחוב, שאיננו שומר שבע מצוות, אתה, איתך הוא אומר, אם יש לנו כוח, אתה רוצה להרוג אותו, אתה רוצה להרוג אותו. So that's straight from the horse's mouth. If you see someone on the street, again, if you're trying to escape on the street and this person is breaking the seven Noahide commandments or the categories and Sabbath is one of them and you have the willpower to kill that person, you are to kill them. Hebrew roots, Jews, Muslims, and the world are being steadily guided into an antichrist law, which is potentially going to be based off of the Noahide laws. Now, with regards to these seven Noahide laws, you may have already heard about them in the past couple of months, simply because there has been a lot of activity or flurry around these terms. Most notably, it's being pushed by those in the Jewish Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism and the Jewish Sanhedrin. This is the legislative and judicial courts of the Jews. These are the same people that persecuted Jesus in the courts as well as the apostles. However, these Noahide laws or the system to implement them has been pushed for about the past three decades or more, at least from what we can tell. Now this snippet comes from Noahide.com. It says, to the Jewish people, God gave the entire Torah teaching as their law. They therefore have a special responsibility with special commandments to be a priesthood of the world, a light unto the nations. The Bible says differently that Jesus Christ is our high priest and the saints will be a royal priesthood to him. But because the Jews are special, what about the rest of the world? What will God do for them? They state that God gave Noah and all his descendants seven commandments to obey. These seven universal laws were reaffirmed with Moses and the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, which is also known as the Oral Torah or Talmud, establishing modern observance of these laws goes on to say these seven commandments actually represent seven categories of hundreds of specific laws for non-Jews. Just like the Torah is 613 laws, then they apply the oral traditions, the oral Talmud on top of that, which has thousands and thousands of other instructions. But the key thing to note here is although you can deduce where the Noahide laws come from in terms of some coming from the Torah or the Ten Commandments, you won't actually find any reference in the Bible saying the Noahide laws. It's not going to list them out. Again, this comes from the oral traditions of the rabbis, the thing that Jesus criticized himself, the Talmud. And the ones who actually interpret the application of these laws is the Sanhedrin or the Jews themselves. So here you can see the seven categories of the laws. And at first glance, you'll see that, hey, they actually sound pretty reasonable. Don't deny God, don't blaspheme God, don't murder, don't steal, things like that. A lot of them sounding like the Ten Commandments. But again, you have to remember who's going to be doing the interpretation of this. It's going to be the Sanhedrin, the Jews themselves. And as we've seen in a lot of those prior videos, 
This is all going to be inspired by the Antichrist when their Messiah comes through. Not just the Jews, but remember, the Jews are expecting a Messiah. The Muslims are actually expecting their Messiah, the Mahdi. There's this tri-faith initiative trying to merge Muslims and Judaism and Christianity all together, saying that we have a father in Abraham that's probably going to be part of this deceit. But again, since this is going to be Antichrist inspired, you have to understand, looking at the first commandment, don't deny God, you'll see in future clips within this video, there are very prominent rabbis of the Temple Institute that are saying that if you do not believe in the God of Judaism, then you will be sentenced to death. Basically, if you support Christianity, if you support Islam, if you support Hinduism, Buddhism, you'll be put to death. You have to observe their God, which will be their Messiah, the Antichrist. I had said that the framework for these Noahide laws has been being built for the past several decades. You can see here from IsraeliNationalNews.com, there are also Noahide groups and communities all throughout the world. Significantly in 1991, President George H.W. Bush signed into law a historic resolution of both houses of Congress recognizing the seven Noahide laws as the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization. In 2013, the UN also had a historic documentation supporting the seven Noahide laws. Again, this is from UN.org. You can see towards the bottom here, Rabbi Yaakov Kohen, head of the Institute of the Noahide Code, which sponsored this conference, said, On this day, people from all over the world gathered on behalf of the laws of Noah. Their observance is required so that the vision of the United Nations to have a settled and civilized world filled with the economic justice and righteousness will prevail. Just a couple years earlier, in 2007, you have this document from the Vatican, Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, the Delegation of the Holy See's Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews. They state that Jewish tradition emphasizes the Noahide Covenant as containing the universal moral code which is incumbent on all humanity. This idea is reflected in Christian scripture in the Book of Acts. Now, you know that I've covered the Vatican a lot, and it is my firm belief that the elite in the Vatican and the Pope are somewhat like the John the Baptist of the Antichrist, and they are one and the same with the elite Zionists. And there is in fact a lot of evidence that the Vatican has wanted to control Jerusalem for quite some time, so all these things play together. Now moving forward a little bit in time, we have our own President Trump being called on by the Sanhedrin to uphold the seven Noahide laws. This is from BreakingIsraelNews.com. It says, In an ancient and honored Jewish custom, the nascent Sanhedrin sent a letter to the new leader of the U.S., President Donald Trump, blessing him and calling him to take the lead in restoring America and the world. The Sanhedrin also called on the new president to acknowledge and uphold the seven Noahide laws. This here is from GotQuestions.com, a familiar Christian site that many people use for research. And it says something very important, which I'm going to show you proof of towards the latter of this film. It says the Talmud, again, the oral written traditions of the rabbis, calls for the capital punishment for Gentiles who violate the Noahide laws. And this has led some to debate as to whether or not Christians who worship Jesus Christ are guilty of violating the first Noahide law and therefore deserving of the death penalty. This is a real risk. And so you start to see how this is all starting to form together. Now, if you think these Noahide laws are just some blown out internet conspiracy, I want to show you some ground level documentation that David from Round Saturn's Eye had collected when he was visiting David's tomb. Check out this letter. It says, we are Orthodox Torah observant Jews. We want to share with humanity the divine light that was imparted on us. The Jewish vision of redemption is universal, and every non-Jew has the right to be illuminated. Nice word there. All you have to do is connect yourself to the eternal declaration of the Jewish people through Moses from Sinai. And what exactly does it mean? Observe the seven Noahide commandments and believe in the God of the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Later on in this note, it actually outright talks about Jesus as a type of anti-Messiah. Now, I'm going to play for you a section here, and this is from uh, uh, Rabbi Levi Shemtov. 
He's a Chabad emissary in Washington, D.C., rabbi to ambassadors, presidents, potentates, shares first-hand accounts on how the Rebbe's teachings have influenced the world's most powerful men and women, recorded on the occasion of the 17th anniversary of, rabbi, uh, of the Rebbe's passing. And you know, when, when I listen to him, you really got to listen to the whole video, all right? And I'll put that in the description below for you guys. But when you listen to Mr. Shemtov and what he says here, if you go through the whole video, he's always quoting Rabbi Schneerson. Rabbi Schneerson said this. Rabbi Schneerson said that. You know, there's some, there's some so-called Christian faiths out there. That, that's what they do. They quote their leaders. So-and-so said this. So-and-so said that. Even the Jehovah's Witness organization. The elders have said this. The elders say that. Whatever the elders say. You know, Yeshua will share his glory with no man. He won't share it with your leader. He won't share it with the Orthodox community's leader. That belongs to him and him alone. And this is one reason why the seven Noahide laws can help silence those believers of Yeshua that will never give up Yeshua as a divine son of God. They'll never forsake him. And they can't have that. That's not all Judaism either. That's those radical... Talmudists, they can't have that because they have been, and really are impressing on world leaders to bring about this change. Listen carefully, especially to the last few minutes when he mentions how many nations, how many countries the movement affects around the world. Listen to what he has to say. She says the Supreme Court of the United States it seemed odd to me that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court would come to this barber in DuPont Circle, but he did. Sure enough, a few minutes later, the limousine pulls up and out walks the Chief Justice, William Rehnquist. The judge presiding over the highest court in the land, coming to get his hair cut. The barber is very excited, and as soon as the Chief Justice walks in, he quickly makes an introduction. He says, this is the rabbi, this is the Chief Justice, he introduces us one to the other. So I don't know how it works here in the Valley, but in Washington, D.C., you make your point very quickly or you don't get to make it at all. So therefore, I have been trained, and in my experiences, I have learned that I need to make a point very quickly sometimes. So I said, Mr. Chief Justice, it's an honor to meet you. I just want you to know that by presiding over a court of justice, you are upholding one of the main principles of the seven Noahide laws which is something very sanctified, notwithstanding your particular legal position. Meaning to say that whether I feel you're right or you're wrong, just the fact that this institution of justice is being upheld is a great precept of the seven Noahide laws, and I want you to know that it's something sanctified from my perspective. So the judge says, I, uh, the justice says, I appreciate that very much. I'll especially remember it the next time I author the dissenting opinion. <laughs> Put on my jacket to leave. And the Chief Justice uh, waves me over to the chair right next to his. And he says, those seven laws, uh, by whom were they given and when? And he motions to me to sit down, and of course, anyone in the United States, when the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States tells you to do something, you do it. Sat down. And we had a whole discussion. He was basically bold, so his uh, haircut didn't take all that long. But, but, say for 15 or 20 minutes, we had a discussion about the seven Noahide laws and about how whatever you do, even sitting on a court, if you do it for the right purpose, it can become divine. After our discussion, he gets up to leave, I get up to leave, and I say, well, Mr. Chief Justice, this has been a wonderful discussion. I hope you have a wonderful day. To which he replies, a wonderful day. <laughs> now I want to have a divine day. <laughs> a few weeks later, I go back for my next haircut, and the barber tells me that Chief Justice had just been in a few days before, was asking where the material was that I was supposed to send them about the seven Noahide laws as a follow-up. And why do I tell you this story? I tell you this story because someone of his stature, recognizing through words that the Rebbe said, which I internalized and then conveyed, agreed with the idea to the point that he mentioned it a few weeks later on his own 
that what you do in life can become divine if you do it for the appropriate purpose. Let me give you another idea. Only a few more seconds. The world, to the diplomatic world. And just to give you a background, my interaction with the diplomatic world is very simple. We in Chabad Lubavitch operate in some 82 countries with satellite operations in another 20 or so more. And as such, different issues arise that necessitate our functioning and interacting with diplomats from many countries. You never know where there's going to be a problem or a need. Did you notice that? The Chabad Lubavitch organization of the Orthodox Jews operates in 82 countries, 20 or so more countries as well. And he goes into there, all the different diplomats, presidents, kings, in fact, that he speaks to. And of course, at the, the tenet of those conversations is to engage the seven Noahide laws upon all of humanity. All right? Now, if we have Ten Commandments, what need do we have of seven Noahide laws? But there are some, and I don't want to say that all Jews necessarily are radical that have this, have this thought. There are some of the Orthodox community that believe that there should be one set of laws for those that are non-Jews and then another set of laws that are just for the Jewish people. That doesn't necessarily translate that it makes them radical because they believe that. But what makes the radical idea is when you know that you're citing a Talmudic law that is not biblical, but you have to understand from the thinking of Orthodox Judaism, many Orthodox Jews believe that the that the oral law, which would be the Talmud, is equivalent to that of the written law of Moses. That it's just as important and just as much to be adhered to. Now, we could argue that's radical, we could argue that's not radical. You could argue that there's good points in the Talmud, and you could argue there's points in the Talmud that are clearly would be very radical in many people's views. But the issue that we take up with this is because we see the encroachment upon the civil rights as well as freedom of speech, which is part of a civil right, but the civil rights of humanity of those that are non-Jews by the interpretation specifically targeting idolatry that would place many Christians in a position of possibly losing their lives in a not so distant future if this continues to move in the direction it's going in now. The Senate will come to order. Today's opening prayer will be offered by guest chaplain Rabbi Shea Harlick of Chabad of Southern Nevada. Almighty God, members of this prestigious body, the United States Senate, convene here in the spirit of one of the seven Noahide laws, which was set forth by you as an eternal universal code of ethics for all mankind. Modern Noahidism, seven commandments, seven laws only, and remaining commandments do not apply to them. This means that Noahides may not observe Sabbath, study Torah, except for the seven laws, which are not part of Torah, all right? And the rainbow is the modern symbol of Noahidism, all right? This is their symbol. We've seen that before, haven't we? We know who uses this symbol nowadays, right? Noahide website. Now, here's an article on gay marriage, but within this, now, it's, they say that they're anti-gay marriage, although, you know, with their rainbow flag and all, I kind of doubt that. But within this article here, it says, in the first marriage ever, Adam and Eve were initially created as a single, two-faced body. The single being was split in two, a man and a woman, and then reunited in matrimony. In the world of souls, the partition and reunification of the male and female components of individual souls occurs 
continually. Celebrating diversity was, was conceived as an opportunity to unite the world by re-echoing the belief in one God as the creator of all human beings and the belief that we are all created in the divine image. What's the divine image? The male and female hermaphrodite God. This is the true meaning of harnessing diversity among different cultures. This is the foundation for our organization's goal, which to work alongside the United Nations and other partner organizations with hopes of promoting human rights and development and protecting freedom of religion. Well, their religion, seven universal laws of Noah are means by which humanity strives to live in unity and peace. The laws of Noah or the Noahide laws are comprised of seven universal laws biblical binding upon all humanity. In 1991, a joint resolution of the United States Congress called its principles the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization, without which the edifice of civilization stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. What is a Noahite? Definition. A Freemason who has taken the 21st degree of the Scottish Rite. 2. Freemason. Albert Mackey says Freemasons come from the Noahites. So basically the Congress said that Freemasonry is the bedrock of civilization. Okay, now this is from the uh, IsraelNationalNews.com. The Noahide Laws, a universal code for peace and unity. It says here, all descendants of Noah, which means all of humanity, are required to follow these laws. Gentiles who actively follow the seven laws of Noah are called B'nai Noach, or Noahides. Sometimes they are referred to as righteous Gentiles, or the pious among the nations. The Noahide laws were given to Moses and also preserved by the sages of the Talmud. All right, now here's the Jewish Institute for Global Awareness. Government leaders encourage adherence to the seven Noahide laws. The universality of these principles and global import was recognized in 1982 by President Ronald Reagan when he spoke of the eternal validity of the seven Noahide laws as a moral code for all of us regardless of religious faith. Proclamation on the National Day of Reflection, April 4th, 1982. Seven years later, 1989, H.W., not only proclaimed that these biblical values, they're not biblical, all right? Freemasonic values are the foundation for civilized society. A society that fails to recognize or adhere to them cannot endure. And it's, you think, these people are clever, right? Because we all, we're all descendants of Noah. So they're, they're saying that the entire world has to follow the laws given to Noah since we're all descendants of, of Noah, right? So legally, we're all bound to this law. Both the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States Congress in 1991 on a bipartisan basis further recognize how this historical tradition of ethical values and principles of Freemasonry upon which our great nation was founded. All right, there it is right there. United States Congress admitted that the United States was founded on the principles of Freemasonry prohibition of idolatry. Well, you might say, well, that sounds just like the Bible. Well, it kind of does sound like the Bible, right? The problem is that the Jews believe Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, is an idol. They're going to call that idolatry, and idolatry is punishable by death. All Breaking any of these laws is the death penalty. This is the New World Order religion. Right here, seven, create a fair and righteous judicial system to enforce the other six laws and all other laws consistent with them. Idolatry, worshiping false gods. The Hebrew term for idolatry, whatever, means strange worship in the sense of being outside the boundaries of that which is permitted by denying pure monotheism. The worship of anything other than God constitutes an act of idolatry. This includes deifying any object other than God, including a deification of the human being. Right? But they're going to include Jesus in this, right? President Bush Roadmap to World Peace. Press release. President George Bush confers with Noahide.org to discuss the importance of seven universal Noahide laws. But the issue today that we look at and that we need to examine is that this separation of church and state that has always been in our Constitution of the United States is being subverted by a new power by a new radical Talmudist lobby 
that is trying to press on the United States the seven Noahide laws. And if you look at the seven Noahide laws from an outset look just at, okay, what are their basic sayings there? Uh, you know, you're not to, um, uh, you know, it's against idolatry, it's against eating, eating the limb of a live animal, uh, you're not to murder, etc. Those basic tenets of the, of the, just the surface look, they appear to mirror that of the Ten Commandments. But the problem is, is all the sub-laws that are being written as well about these Noahide laws, and of course their source. They are Talmudic. They are uh, most, most notably written by Rambam, you know, the Memonides, part of the Mishnah of the Talmud uh, that was written over a thousand years ago. And there are some very radical Talmudists that are pushing those, and they have been placed into our education day bill of the United States, and it's been signed by every president since that of President George H.W. Bush. On this website right here, Congress.gov, this is where the very bill uh, that was passed, that was uh, submitted there in honor of Rabbi Menachem Schneerson's birthday, uh, how this crept into our own Congress here in the United States and then was actually signed by President H.W. Bush. So I wanted to read this to you just a little bit. H.J. Resolution 104 to designate March the 26th, 1991 as Education Day USA. Now it's interesting because it's called Education Day USA and you have to wonder what do the seven Noahide laws have to do with Education Day? We would expect this to be something about schools or something. Uh, honoring teachers, you might even think. Well, it only honors only one teacher, and that is Rabbi Menachem Schneerson uh, of the Chabad Lubavitch organization, whom many of the uh, uh, Chabad Jews believe to have been the Messiah. Uh, but anyway, it goes on to say, to, de de to designate March the 26th, 1991, as Education Day USA, whereas Congress recognized the historical tradition of ethical values and principles, which are the basis of civilized society and upon which our great nation was founded. Whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization when they were known as the seven Noahide laws. You see that for yourself right there? See, this is from the congress.gov from their website H.J. Resolution 104, I think it's dash 12 if you want to be more specific, to designate March 26, 1991 as Education Day USA. And of course, they tell you that whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization where they were known as the seven Noahide laws. So much for separation of church and state. Well, I guess it's okay because... The Founding Fathers didn't want Catholicism to rule the United States as it was doing all across Europe. So that's why we put that in there. But no one never anticipated that we would have radical Talmudism bringing in a Talmudic law and saying that our nation is now being founded on Talmudic laws. No, I didn't anticipate that one either, right? So anyway. Whereas without these ethical values and principles, the edifice of civilization stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. That's important right there as well. Not only are they saying that these seven Noahide laws are the bedrock of civilization, but having them placed in the educational law system there is the principles to edify so the civilization stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. In other words, if they don't put these laws and make them part of the law of the land, we could re return to chaos. Whereas society is profoundly concerned with the recent weakening of these principles that has resulted in crises that beleaguer and threaten the fabric of civilized society. Do you realize what, what, the, what Congress did here and what the Senate passed and what the President H.W. Bush signed is basically saying without the, the seven Noahide laws put into law in the United States, it becomes a national crisis. That's basically what they're saying. I mean, look at what they said. Stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. That's a national crisis for America. So the seven Noahide laws are necessity 
to avoid a national crisis is really what it comes down to. Let's continue on. Whereas the justified preoccupation with these crisis must not let the citizens of this nation lose sight of their responsibility to transmit these historical ethical values from our distinguished past to the generations of the future. That's why they're under Education Day. Same thing in Florida, put under educational laws. It almost makes you wonder if they're going to do away with the older generation and start afresh anew. Whereas the Lubavitch movement has fostered and promoted these ethical values and principles throughout the world. Did you notice that right there in the blue? Throughout the world. Who did it? The Chabad Lubavitch movement. Okay? And again, doesn't mean that everybody that's in the Chabad uh, group are, are, are bad people, but there is radicalism that is on the rise. Whereas Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, leader of the Lubavitch movement, is universally respected and revered, and his 89th birthday falls on March 26, 1991. Whereas, in tribute to this great spiritual leader, the Rebbe, this has his 90th year, will be seen as one of education and giving. The year in which we turn to education and charity to return the world to the moral and ethical values contained in the seven Noahide laws. Return the world, which we turn to educate. Are you serious? To return the world? Return the world to moral and ethical values contained in the seven Noahide laws. You know, maybe had they not have all these sub laws in there that the radical Talmudists have put in there, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But then again, why do you have to throw the Ten Commandments out? Why couldn't we keep the Ten Commandments? Do you think that these seven Noahide laws do more than the Ten Commandments? Well, you might get rid of a radical group that uh, they're what they consider to be a radical group, the Christians that believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that might help the cause. Whereas, this will be reflected in the International Scroll of Honor signed by the President of the United States and other heads of state. Now, therefore, be it. All right, now I just kind of stopped right there. Notice, it wasn't just the President, but other heads of state. That's other country leaders as well. Now, as you can see right here, I have on the screen for you here, this is President Donald J. Trump signing once again in, and that's the bad thing. It'd be one thing if they just signed it back when H.W. Bush was in office, all right, that was bad enough, but every year there's a recommitment, a reaffirmation of these seven Noahide laws. And President Trump, surrounded by Chabad Lubavitch rabbis, are all there to make sure that the president continues in the tradition of the radical side of Talmudism and signs this legislation once again. Now, I find it very fascinating when I saw that image of President Trump surrounded by these rabbis here, knowing that the law of idolatry that is in these seven Noahide laws, which I must stress are not biblical, Nowhere in the Bible do we have seven Noahide laws. When they cite it, they cite Genesis. Chapter 9, I believe it is, where Noah, when his seven sons, they come out, and Noah starts giving the commandment of not to kill. And then they interpret his words about, you know, okay, you got to drain the blood out of the animal before you can eat the animal. All right? That's just an interpretation. He not quite worded that way but the thing is though look at the picture President Trump basically represents Romanism of today the Western society he represents what's supposed to be uh, America a Christian nation right he's surrounded by Orthodox Jews from the Chabad Lubavitch organization specifically, okay? But if we go back in time, there was another Western civilization, a Roman leader. In fact, I wish I could have found the picture of Trump and Mike Pence together, it would have made it even more profound. <clears throat> and he is also, Pontius Pilate is surrounded by what? Orthodox rabbis. To persuade him that Yeshua is a radical man and must be put to death. 
And whether Donald Trump knows it or not, according to Rambam, the very man that includes the Noahide laws in his Law of the Kings, the Mishnah, the Talmud that he writes, Mammonides, the sub-law of idolatry are those that proclaim worship to another person other than Yehovah. The tetragrammaton yod heh vav -He, the divine name of God himself, that if you put Jesus as divine, you are guilty of idolatry. And according to Rambam's own writings on these sub-laws for the seven Noahide laws, it is a punishment under, to, under the Talmud. This is not a matter of radical Talmud there. That's just whoever believes who in the Talmud. Because not all, not all rabbis of the Talmud believe that uh, there should be two different sets of laws for the people. There shouldn't be a, a Noahide law for the Gentiles and the Ten Commandments for the Jews. Rashi actually disagreed with him. But unfortunately, the radical Talmudists, many of which are part of the Chabad movement, are all about standing with Rambam and not Rashi's interpretation. So they're pushing the seven Noahide laws. And people that think that this is no big deal, oh, it's just ended up an education day. Then why do we have to have a ceremony every year signing this? Why is it not just in the United States, but the Philippines, Europe, many of the nations there, all over the world, these are being lifted up as some kind of great thing. And again, as I say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Words. Nothing has changed, only the time. A Roman leader surrounded by radical Talmudists. Because believe me, the Jews there that hated Jesus was not all of Judaism. Even there were Jews that did not believe that Yeshua was the Messiah, but they still were not out there wanting his death. And there were many that had to be persuaded by radicalism to, to cry out for his blood. So I just thought that was interesting. Only time has changed. And that cry for a law to be passed or to be enacted or to be, in this case here, they're not there requesting him to pass anything. It's already been done. But it places, I know there are some that believe, there are some very well-known uh, Christian ministers out there that say, there's nothing to it, this will ne it doesn't matter, okay, it's just, all right, it's there, but it's uh, no big deal. If it's not a big deal, then why put it in there in the first place? As my wife would often say, if you put Sharia law, under an education thing, you're not really making it a law of the land. We just include it under an education part of the law there. And, well, it's only going to be for the Muslims of America. And every year, the, the uh, clerics from the Muslim community were to come and join up with the President of the United States and have him to re-sign the dedication uh, for maybe one, some famous Muslim guy. And that, uh, that, they're, that they're honoring as Education Day the Sharia laws. I think every Christian in this country would go ballistic. And a lot of people that are not Christians would go ballistic. But because we have some radical Talmudists that do it, and because the, the evangelical Christians have been so took in by Israel becoming a nation, that under the Talmudic law, that it means the putting to death of the believers if it's ever fully put into force. And there's a great movement already. You don't have to take my word for it. Look it up online. There is a great movement amongst the elite leaders of Israel to replace the United Nations with the Sanhedrin Council. I mean, we are seeing, like never before in the history of humanity, we are seeing the same stage it was set 2,000 years ago when Jesus was being put on trial. We're seeing that same stage set again today. When he was being put on trial, there was a Sanhedrin court. There were the 70 courts there. The Romans were also involved in power 
2,000 years ago. This Nostra Aetate that was signed some over 50 years ago, like 53 years ago, that, that was reaffirmed on the 50th anniversary with the Jew World Jewish Congress was a major ordeal there. Part of that Nostra Aetate was to bring back together the Jews and the Romans once again, in this case here, the Roman Catholic Church, to reunite them. And of course they say in there that, you know, the Jews were not responsible for the death of Jesus. Well, in a way they weren't, you know, I'll agree with that. They didn't, they didn't uh, drive the nails in per se, but they condemned him to death. Pilate didn't want to condemn him to death. And I think it's the same way today. But the problem is, just like it was 2,000 years ago, it's at a time where it's almost too late to change it now. The power that was exercised by the radical Talmudist of 2,000 years ago, of the oral law, that held the oral law higher, had gotten so much momentum that when they were ready, they what did they do? They even blamed, they blamed Yeshua and his followers for trying to overthrow the government. For insurrection. What are they doing today? What is happening amongst the, the, the apologists for the radical Talmudists and the radical Talmudists of today? They're saying that what we're trying to warn the people about, that we oppose the seven Noahide laws in the Constitution of the United States, that it's not constitutional, and that these laws that are being passed that are impinging on the free speech of our Constitution here in the United States, that we are going to create the problem. That we are, just like it was in the days of Jesus, the insurrection, that you have to put them down because they're going to cause a problem and, and, and the people will rile up. Just the opposite. Just like with Yeshua, we, we beg the people, be peaceful with people, show love and kindness. No matter how radical this may get, always show the love of Christ. Hello YouTube family um, and fellow Christians in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to speak to uh, very quickly about something that um, you may have been hearing about. I know it's a fairly new subject to me. I did not know about uh, the Noahide laws, but you may be, be, be hearing something more about it. I want you, as Christians, we have been tending to be very excited to hear about temple, the temple being built, about all the temple implements being built. We've been wanting to really get behind that because, you know, we, we want to see Jesus come back so we get all excited. We need to be highly careful here because what we are, what we are throwing our money towards, if you're throwing financial support towards building the temple, rebuilding the temple, I caution you very strictly to listen to this for a minute. What you don't know or what you may not be being told is that the people who are rebuilding this temple um, are the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin have um, come up with a thing called the Noahide Law. Um, this has to do, it sounds very much like the Ten Commandments. However, there's only seven of these. Uh, it's supposed to predate the actual Ten Commandments. They call it the Noahide Laws. It has nothing to do with Noah. has nothing to do with anything. These are completely contrived by man, by the Sanhedrin, by the, the Orthodox Jews who are into the Kabbalah um, <clears throat> and believe in a very mystical system, uh, but but the thing about these people is they've been around for a very, very long time. In fact, the Noahide laws were brought to the United States in 1991 and signed off by our president at the time, signed off that we would implement that Noahide law. It would become something that we would agree to do. You know, should should whatever happen, I don't know. 
I'm, I'm not exactly clear on what was in the paperwork on this and why our presidents are signing off on it. But let's look at this Noah law for a minute. If you go and you research it, and please research it, okay, research this. The Orthodox Jews who are wanting to build, rebuild the temple and wanting to restart this animal sacrifice and who have gone and they've rededicated um, the altar, you might have seen that recently. Let me just say, what do you believe Jesus thinks about that? You know, while we're very excited about the uh, temple getting rebuilt, Jesus was the final sacrifice, was he not? Was he not the completed work of sacrifice? Is there any animal that can be sacrificed that would top what Jesus did? There should be no more animal sacrifice. When I saw the temple uh, um, institute go ahead and, and have a, a dedication of the altar service, it struck my spirit as being such a slap in the face of Jesus. They're trying to disregard him and go back to the law. We as Christians should not be in financial support for this. Here's why. In the Noahide law, it will be illegal for you as a Christian to worship Jesus as God, as the Son of God. This would be considered heresy and you would be put to death. Guess how? By guillotine. Your head, you would be beheaded. That is the Noahide law for correction on anyone that dares step out um, against anything in that Noahide law. It is specific towards believers <laughs> in that you also cannot participate, if you're not a Jew, in any of the feasts. You cannot, um, they're very, very harsh and very strict laws. Now, every president since 1991, every single year, has signed off on the Noahide law as being implemented in the nation. It is under the radar. It's something we did not know was going on. And unfortunately, our own Donald Trump has signed off now on it twice. He's been in office two years. His son-in-law, Jared Kirshner, who is an Orthodox Kabbalist Jew, has um, convinced him or made him believe that this is okay and this is something that all presidents have signed off on and we just need to continue this. Know that the Orthodox Jews in Israel called Jesus the bastard even now. And if you go and you look at what they say, even at the temple when they were dedicating this altar and someone brought up Jesus, the foulness and the evil spoken against him is not something we should be throwing any of our money towards. Not only that, the Noahide laws is very interesting. It has gone around the world. It has been implemented and signed off in every nation. And you wonder, how can that be? How can a Jewish law go into effect or be part of any other Arab nations or, or places that are, uh, um, you know, how would they dare? But they have, they have. This has been a, a movement for many, many years. And it has been secretly and openly in some places signed off to on proudly president trump did it in front of cameras for every the whole world to see we was surrounded by orthodox jews when he signed it does he know what he's really signing does he know he's signing a death warrant to christians should these laws go into effect i don't know if he knows all of that we have to pray for our president that he would have wisdom because these are dangerous to us as believers. So look at this yourself and, and, and please Christians step away from supporting the Temple Institute and, and wanting so badly to see Jesus come back that you think this is a good thing. Please, it is not a good thing. They're implementing the law again 
And that animal sacrifice is a slap in the face of Jesus Christ, who did the final and only sacrifice needed forever. So think about what you're doing. Think about what's going down. Not only that, I also want to say that the Noahide laws are also... Um, um, they when they implement when they went and rededicated the, the the altar, they invited seventy nations, seventy nations to participate, and come and witness this. However, when push comes to shove, no one but Orthodox Jews in the end will be allowed to do or be a part of any of this. But the, but they have seventy nations. Gathered together, you research 70 nations in the Bible and what it says in the end times, how there would be a, a, a gathering of 70 nations. We are right there at the door. And the fact that they want to behead believers, is this not the beast system? Here we thought it was coming from Muslims. It's sneaking in the back door. So I want to say something briefly here before I go on with the, the Noahide law and the explanation of that. I want to say something here about my professional background before we, we go into that too deeply because in this video and in the context of what we're talking about, it may be helpful for you as just listening to me talk to realize that I have a background in law and government. Um, when I first graduated from college, I worked in law. In fact, uh, it was the subject of my degree, the topic of my degree. After I worked in law, I worked in law for about 13 years, and then I went to work for government and did some, in both careers, I did very complex and technical work that was not only focused on policies, but also laws that exist at the state level or even up at the federal level. Like back in Washington, D.C., I was back there a lot, actually, when I worked for government. So I also did a lot of technical and summary writing. And for those of you who don't know what that is or what it entails, let me just say it really briefly because I don't want to get sidetracked too much from the video's topic and what we're talking about. But succinctly stated, I have the kind of brain that can just take very complex and voluminous legal documents, really a lot of red tape information that most people can't even, won't even read. I just have the kind of mind that can go through that uh, you know, voluminous, complex legal documents, study them and write a summary document, something very brief so that people can understand what's been said. And legalese, of course, is the language of law, and it's in a lot of the documents that I've worked with over the last 25 or 30 years. Um, I understand them easily because I've worked with it so much and I've been to so many law classes and I've worked on so many cases and I've worked on so many government documents. But for a lay person to sit and read a 500 page wordy cumbersome document that's full of legalese and contains requirements for our state to implement at the state, county, city, all the stuff I used to do, they just, most people don't. It's not a smarter thing, it's just something you have to become expert in. Like you have to become expert in whatever your field is. That is where my expertise lies. I'm, I'm very good at understanding those very complex documents and I understand the language of law, which we refer to as legalese. One thing I wanna say about that is real world value. When I see laws passed or things on a voting ballot or whatever it is, I know for sure that a big part of whatever they're presenting to the public is is not there. So the public has no earthly idea that whatever they're voting for, whatever they think they're supporting, as far as regulations, policies, laws, they don't know what they're supporting. They're just looking at the front issue. They're looking at whatever the news put out in front of them. And a lot of times, I would say most of the time, when you're voting for something or you're supporting um, a bill or a regulation or being, you know, listening to something on the news or people politically campaigning, there's 90% that you're not being told. And those things are nefarious. There's a reason they don't go through everything that's attached to a law that they want you to support. It's kind of like looking in the ocean and there's a, like a, one of the Hawaiian islands or something, and you see the top of some of these islands sticking out of the water. There's a little tiny bit out of the water, even though it looks like a whole lot of land in one place. But if you could see underneath like an iceberg, there's a whole lot more underneath the water that you cannot see. It's kind of how laws in our legal system works. And so I've said, said many times that people that work in law and people that work in government, there's a lot of good people in both. Um, 
but the system itself is corrupt, immensely corrupt. And it's so complex that they say it would take 40 years for for a lawyer to even become expert in one kind of law. So you can imagine there's hundreds of types of law that people practice, even in this country, that are just major major categories. It would take lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. And that's that's because of the legal complexity and legal ease and simple words don't mean uh, uh, what they what you what you think they do. Anyway, the system, our, our legal system has a real problem. And because government is so closely tied with politics and based on laws, um, the whole system is a is a house of cards waiting to fall. It's it's very unethical. There is high level evil running governments across this world, and that is just the truth of it. It's just, it just doesn't matter who you know that works for that's a good person. That's whatever. They're not in charge of the system. They're not invited to the closed door meetings of whoever actually is funding the governments and redirecting our taxes and doing all these nefarious things. But whatever the system, and I think everybody probably can agree that the governments all over the world are visibly corrupted at this point. So I say all that just to say that I am familiar with laws. I'm familiar with how they're written. I understand the verbiage that most people might, that haven't worked closely with laws or real complex information, might not see it for what it is. I just, I see it differently. I can, I can pick out points. You know, I can write a one page document that you would understand very well from a 100 page legal document. And that's called a summary document. I know I've done that over and over and over in my life. So when I started looking into this, um, I just, it just kind of popped out at me anyway. With all this said, let's get back to the days of Noah and the laws that were in effect during, during that time, or as we call it, no, no hide law. I'm going to read from the law that designed, that was designated Education Day in the USA way back in March of 1991. And this is from the 102nd Congress of the United States. It's a House Joint Resolution, uh, HJ Resolution 104, as a, as a matter of fact, a joint, joint House resolution. And for those of you who don't read laws or are not used to legalese, I'll just, this is not, I'm not going to read like the pages and pages and pages of this law. I'm just going to read a summary of it. And again, it's uh, here's a, here's an excerpt from something that is called Education Day USA. Quote, 102nd Congress of the United States of America at the first session began and held at the city of Washington on Thursday, the third day of January, 100, 1,990. 91 joint resolution to designate March 21st, 1991 as Education Day USA, whereas Congress recognizes the historical tradition of ethical values and principles, which are the basis of civilized society and are upon which our great nation was founded. Whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization when they were known as the seven Noahide laws. Whereas without these ethical values and principles, the edifice of civilization stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. Whereas society is profoundly concerned with the recent weakening of these principles that has resulted in crisis that beleaguer and threaten the fabric of civilized society. Whereas the justified preoccupation with these crises must not let the citizens of this nation lose sight of their responsibility to transmit these historical ethical values from our distinguished past to the generations of the future. Whereas the Lubavitch movement has fostered and promoted these ethical values and principles throughout the world. Whereas Rabbi Mecha Mendel Schneerson, leader of the Lubavitch movement, is universally respected and revered, and his 89th birthday falls on March 26, 1991. Whereas, in tribute to this great spiritual leader, the Rebbe, this, his 90th year, will be seen as one of, quote, education and giving, unquote the year in which we turn to education and charity to return the world to the moral and ethical values contained in the seven Noahide laws. And whereas this will be reflected in an international scroll of honor signed by the President of the United States and other heads of state. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that March 26, 1991, the start 
of the 90th year of Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, leader of the worldwide Lubavitch movement, is designated as Education Day USA. The president is requested to issue a proclamation calling upon the people of the United States to observe such day with appropriate ceremonies and activities. Speaker of the House of Representatives, Vice President of the United States, and President of the State, end quote. Now, let me break down for you what all of that legalese means. Basically, a law was passed in 1991 to bring the seven Noahad laws back into effect, but under this auspices of Education Day to recognize a man who they consider to be a great spiritual leader. And it wasn't just signed by the President of the United States, but elsewhere in the world too. Other leaders of, of the world signed it as well. So why, pray tell, did they feel the need to bring the seven no hide laws into this conversation at all. <laughs> and especially back in 1991, like, why haven't we heard of this? Well, right in the language of this resolution that I just read, they said that basically the leaders of the world are concerned that getting away from the moral code of the Noahide laws has caused a breakdown in the fabric of society, and they don't want any more chaos or crises up ahead. And that this spiritual leader that promoted these is coming up on his 90th birthday to celebrate that we're going to implement this education day and then it goes into the, all this this verbiage about oh yeah by the way the no hide laws are going to come back into effect anyway also in that legal verbiage i read from the resolution of education day we heard something about the lubavitch movement and so basically the Lubav the lubavitch movement uh, was formed from writings of a rabbi named Schneer Zalman who published something called the Tanya, which contains the key elements of Jewish mystical and spiritual awareness. And after that rabbi died, another rabbi named Schneerson, who was also a Lubavitcher Rebbe, they call it R-E-B-B-E, -E, instead of saying rabbi, carried it forward. But what I really want you to understand and hear about this is that we're not talking about God's Jewish people here when we say rabbi or rebbe, as they call it in these laws. We're talking about people who practice mysticism, things God forbids, and then they call it Jewish. They say that they say that it's Jewish mysticism or Jewish spiritual practices or whatever. And what we've heard about modern day mystical practices and spiritual practices that people say is tied to Jewish practice or Jewish faith. Well, we have the Jewish cabal for one thing. If you look up the word cabal, the definition is likened to a cult or close knit group of people who have secrets, etc. You ever seen that little red bracelet that so many of the movie stars, it's kind of like a string bracelet, um, movie stars and rock stars. Uh, basically witches of Hollywood like Madonna and Lady Gagface wear that little red string of a bracelet thing. It means they're members of the cabal or some other mystical or spiritual practice that they say is related to Judaism and Judaism and it's not. The truth is there are so many people today calling themselves Jewish either by faith or culture, but they're not truly Jewish and God knew there were people who would be involved in mystic religions or forbidden spiritual practices you know, throughout history, but especially in these last days. And those people would defile the word Jewish. It's in the Bible. In fact, Revelation 3 verse 9 says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but they lie or but lie. So God knows there are people who say they're Jews, but they're really not, or they're practicing Jewish faith, but they're really not. So now I'll get back to this, this Noahide law in a second, but I think, um, Think about the agenda that's cropped up here in the past few years, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. We've, we're hearing about it again, and I call it the anti-Semitism agenda. This is not the first time humans have heard that word. When Trump came into office, there weren't all of a sudden all these anti-Semitics running around. You know, these are accusations that anyone who speaks against Jewish people, whether they claim to be Jewish by culture, religion, whether they're lying about Jewish or not, whatever the case is, if you say anything about Jewish people, all of a sudden you're accused of being anti-Semitic. I just, I hear this all the time. It's just ridiculous to me. Just another agenda. But anti-Semitism is basically hostility to prejudice or discrimination against the Jews. And that is a real thing. I mean, Think of what Hitler and Stalin did to millions of Jews during the Holocaust. I mean, absolutely sad and awful and disgustingly horrific. However, speaking the truth and saying that, hey, you aren't Jewish, or hey, 
these people that practice Kabbalism or practice Bab, you know, things out of the Babylonian Talmud, they're not God's people. Those are not God's chosen people. And but if you say that, even people at pastors in the church, I hear them all the time saying, "No, don't accuse me of being anti-Semitic." I would just say, "Stop saying that. <laughs> You're not being anti-Semitic." But but that's the world we live in. I mean, it's too bad we have to do that. But the being everybody accusing everybody else of being anti-Semitic is a thing. And it's just, it's really ridiculous, but it is an agenda. And I'm telling you that it's just another agenda that's been forced out in public to prepare the way for this Noahide law to be forced upon humans all over this earth. And I'll tie this together in a minute. Stay with me. And by the way, if you're unfamiliar, the Talmud that I mentioned is the body of Jewish civil and ceremonial law. However, there are two versions of the Talmud. There's a Babylonian Talmud, which dates from like the 5th century AD, um, but it also includes the earlier material. And then the second, or the, the other Talmud is the, they refer to it as the Palestinian or the Jerusalem Talmud, and, and some people call that the Jewish Talmud. So these books are, those books are not the word of God. They're those collections of laws and customs customary ceremonies and all those things. They're not the word of God. They're not the Bible. The Jewish people, whether they practice mystic Kabbalist things or whether they adhere to the Jewish Talmud, they still, all of them deny that Jesus Christ is the, the Messiah still to this day. So it is the very reason that God is turning his attention back to Israel and those people over there, you know, the Jewish people, Jewish by culture, um, he's, he's turning his focus back to Israel during the seven year tribulation or what we call Daniel's 70th week, of course, the tribulation is going to affect the whole world and the whole world's going to come under judgment. But for biblical, for documentation purposes, we've got this age of grace going on here, which we're at the very end of now and um, where the Gentiles were offered the gospel. Thank the Lord for that. And then it's going to, God's going to turn his attention back to his original people, the Jewish people. Okay. So, God himself says that there are people who are of the synagogue of Satan. They're practicing Satanism in some form, yet they lie and say they, were, they are Jews. They lie and say they're God's people. They deny Christ. And if you say anything like that, the people that are uneducated, unsteady, and just adhere to the mainstream rhetoric, they'll accuse you of being anti-Semitic. Okay, so now, why would the social engineers of society push that word anti-Semitic back into public? Why, why would that? I mean, the, the crux of it is to shut down anyone who speaks anything about Jewish religions at all, including the mystic and the cabal. They just don't separate it. They take all these mystic religions and these Kabbalist practices and even what's going on in Hollywood and they lump it all in and say it's Jewish. And if you speak anything about it, they call you anti-Semitic. Why? That's being pushed out in the public the last couple of years quite intentionally. Nothing gets socially engineered into this world without it being intentional from those higher ups these days. Kind of like being famous in Hollywood. Nobody's getting famous in Hollywood unless they are involved in pretty nefarious things. What I should say they don't stay famous in Hollywood. That's probably a better way to put it. But but why would that be an agenda? Why is that word anti Semitic being pushed out again? Well, I think it's it's has something to do with this nineteen ninety one resolution, this law we just read that says Noah Hyde law will be brought back. So it's it's already been brought back on paper, clearly. They're just waiting to push it out in public and start enforcing it. Now, I'm not going to go into three or four hours of the history of law in Noah's time, um, because honestly, it's been adulterated for one thing, but another thing is there are, there are documents on top of documents and laws on top of laws, and it's complex, and your eyes will roll back in your head. So, and then you'll just fall asleep. <laughs> you won't get the message I'm trying to convey here about this uh, Noahide law and why it will be eventually enforced again. But so let me just cut to the chase. There's seven Noahide laws, seven. And I'll tell you what those seven laws are. But keep in mind what I just said about the anti Semitism. We all have a society that is primed to attack anyone that says anything about Jewish practices or Jewish faith. Um, or even mystic Kabbalism, which claims to be connected to the Jewish faith. But um, all over the world, people are afraid to speak about all kinds of things, and no one wants to be accused of being anti-Semitic so, or racist, for that matter. So these seven laws of Noahide 
are one thing that people are not really going to speak out about because I've already been conditioned not to say anything about Jewish practices. And it's the Jewish practices, the rabbis, as we just read in that resolution, the law, it, it, they're the ones that are, have brought this back. That that was what it was connected to in connection with this honoring of Education Day. And for that that rabbi that was turning 90 years old in 1991, he soon, he's since passed on, of course, but... But those practices continued on after his death, and we have them written in law now in the United States even, just kind of like I said, they're in abeyance, they're in the background just waiting to be enforced on the public. So the seven laws of Noah or Noahide laws, as they were documented, are number one, not to worship idols, number two, not to curse God, number three, to establish uh, courts of justice, number four, not to commit murder, Number five, not to commit adultery or sexual immorality. Number six, not to steal. Number seven, not to eat flesh torn from a living animal. So that all sounds good, right? I mean, God wouldn't want us to worship idols. He doesn't want us to curse his name. Um, We need courts of justice so that the really hardcore crime doesn't run rampant. And so it all sounds like it's straight from the Bible, right? So those were seven laws given to the sons of Noah, technically speaking, back in the day. A lot of history there. I don't want to go into the ins and outs of all that because it's a huge study. And like I said, we'd be here for five videos from now, still going through all of it. But number one, people are not to worship idols. Let's focus on that. Let's focus on the first of the seven Noahide laws, not to worship idols. That's that's technically written into law now. Um and that agrees with what God said. God said, God forbids idolatry, right? That's the first Noahide law. Don't worship idols. All sounds good. But wait a second. What does idols mean in the Noahide law? Which idols? Does that mean the same as what the Bible says? After all, the God of the Bible, the real God, the one true living God, Almighty God, the Father Abba, he doesn't want us to worship idols or curse God or commit adultery or, or murder or any of those things. He doesn't want us to steal or eat flesh torn from living animals, of course. But here's the problem. Legalese. Remember that? Legalese, the language of law that I talked about earlier in this video. Words that are in laws and other fine print that the public is not told about. You know, things that you think you're voting for one thing or you think you're supporting one law, but there's so much behind it that you're not told or you don't see. You have to know what the words mean when laws are passed, and you have to know the fine print that they're not passing out to anybody. You have to dig, and and in the case of laws, there's always fine print. There's always something very deep to study, other than the information which is being presented to you. So, for example, let's look at the first Noahide law. It's not to worship idols, like I just said. In this context, when you look into this, this number one of the seven Noahide laws and study What the researchers who have pulled all the information together about this, when you study that, you'll find that people that worship idols under Noahide law will be exterminated. That's the modern day as of the last 20 years. If if the law allows for people to be killed if they worship idols, that's number one. They can be killed in one of four ways. Now listen, the most gentle of the four ways that people who worship idols in the future will be killed is, you guessed it, beheading. So people who worship idols, when this law comes back into public and starts being enforced, they will most commonly be beheaded. They can be killed in one of three other ways too that are not as, not as gentle. But beheading, that should ring a bell. Keep that in your mind. Now back to the idols part of that first law. What idols? What idols is the public not supposed to worship? Well, under that particular law and how it is documented, it's anyone who does not worship the ruler of this world, whatever is considered the one in charge, whatever that one world religion is, whoever they worship. If you worship anyone other than that, under the one world religion that's coming, Those are the people that will be beheaded. And who decides that? These Jewish, whatever sect they put themselves into that will be enforcing these laws. So do the Jewish people worship Jesus Christ and recognize him as the true Messiah? Nope. So fast forward to a few years from right now, from where we are right now. 
And who's on scene? Well, that'd be the Antichrist. Who's in charge? The Antichrist. Is the whole world worshiping him? Yep, the Bible says that's, that's exactly what will happen. Will we have a one world religion? Yep. Is a pope doing that right now? Absolutely, he is. There's an interfaith movement that's been going on for about 10 years. It's been ramping up the last three years. I guarantee you, if you go to a, a big church or a 5013C, some pastor in that organization or their administrators have already been sent back to visit with the Pope. And the whole purpose of that is the unification of religions. So that's been underway for a while. As I always say, the Bible is unfolding like a script. But if you haven't guessed it by now, bringing Noah Hyde Law back in 1991, a couple decades ago, even though it's just sitting in the background for now, waiting to be enforced on the public, that was a very intentional thing that lawmakers here in other parts of the world did, and it set the stage for the coming Antichrist. And it also passed laws saying that whoever does not worship the beast, whoever does not fall in line with a one world religion system, can legally be murdered. First out of four ways to murder them is beheading. So worshiping idols under Noahide law is a law that's already been passed back in brings the death penalty. So let's read that again. The first law under these Noahide laws that were already passed in 1991 and were just sitting waiting to be enforced. Number one, can't worship idols. So if you were to read that at first pass and you were the public, you go, yeah, no, totally. I support that. We shouldn't be able, nobody should be able to worship all these idols anymore. It's caused all kinds of problems. But wait, what does idols mean? Who idols? What, what's idols mean? So see what I mean? You have to break down every word and look into it and see what do they consider an idol and who gets to decide what an idol is. It's kind of like the hate speech agenda. Who gets to decide what hate means? Or the uh, fake news agenda. Who gets to decide what's fake and what's truth? You see the problem? Somebody nefarious is in charge and Satan's in charge of this world. We know that for sure. And, And that's where this whole problem comes in. The people that will be worshiping Jesus Christ, whether you want to call yourself a Christian or a believer, you're going to be beheaded for that. And this is how it's going to happen legally. This is how it's going to be brought back out in public. The foundation for it has already been laid. The stage is set. This also ties in with the apostasy that is that is coming into the church and has been for for years these mega churches and the people this once saved always saved argument and all the whole mess that's involved with that when we're told the way to be saved in Romans 10 verse 9 confessing with our mouth and believing that Jesus is Lord that is required clearly it says that in the Bible but there's a lot to that word believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and knowing that Jesus is Lord know God and love him and believe him And if we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe in God and what he says, then we know we have to obey him. We have to repent of our sins, turn our lives around, let the Holy Spirit lead us in all ways. Do we mess up still? Yep, we're human. We're still learning. We're still growing. We're still being tested. We have to walk the walk, not just say, I'm a believer. Or for some people, I'm a Christian. Um, I've said before on this channel, it's nothing against the word Christian. I know lots of people say they're Christians and that really are true Christians, true believers. But If the word Christian meant what it should mean, I'd have no problem saying I'm a Christian, but I don't call myself a Christian because the truth is Catholics say they're Christians. Mormons say they're Christians. The old Joel Olsteins and Oprah Winfrey's, they're all saying they're Christians. There's, there's all kinds of people in religions saying they're Christians and I'm not that I'm a Bible believer. I'm a follower of the way Jesus Christ taught us to go. I'm the follower of Jesus Christ. I try my best to live as God tells us to live. And so that is why I always say I'm a believer. I prefer to separate myself out these days because the word Christianity has so much apostasy and false religions and false teachings tied to it now. Seeker friendly mega churches and all of the sin friendly pastors that are just trying to fill seats in their churches. That's what Christianity means to most people when you say you're a Christian. So anyway, the apostasy is important because in this context of what we're talking about, because the falling away that Jesus said will occur before he comes back, that's already happening. And it's happening in the Christian churches. And why are so many Christians being misled or believers being misled? Because they're not reading their own Bibles. 
They don't know God. They don't know Jesus for themselves. They're banking their entire salvation on what the preacher at their church says every Sunday. They go back out and they tear a path of sin for the next seven days after church. Then it's back to the church, punch the church time card, throw a few dollars in the offering plate, and then back out into the world to sin for seven more days. And on and on and on it goes. Like David Wilkerson said in this last video I posted um, on this channel, too many pastors of Christian churches today are only interested in the business side of Jesus Christ, and they will be held accountable for that, for misleading so many people, watchmen on the wall that did not warn that trouble was coming. This is from uh, Jewish Institute for Global Awareness. Government leaders encourage adherence to the seven Noahide laws. So if you don't think this is not real, read what it says. The universality of these principles and global important, excuse me, import was recognized in 1982 by President Ronald Reagan when he spoke to the eternal validity of the seven Noahide laws. Eternal validity? By the way, Jewish Institute for Global Awareness is a Jewish website. Okay? As a moral code for all us, regardless of religious faith, Proclamation of the National Day of Re uh, Reflection, April 4th, 1982. So even before it came into the, to, uh, under Rabbi Menachem Schneerson's Education Day USA, it were already being promoted by uh, President Ronald Reagan in 82. Seven years later, in 1989, uh, President H.W. Bush only proclaimed that these biblical values are the foundation for civilized society. But he also recognized that a society that fails to recognize to adhere to them cannot endure. Wow. He understood how these principles of moral and ethical conduct that have formed the basis of civilized civilization comes to us in part from the centuries-old seven Noahide laws. In doing so, he noted their origins. And he quote, unquote, this is H.W. Bush, president, former president. The Noahide laws are actually seven commandments given to man by God as recorded in the Old Testament. They're not in the Old Testament. Both the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States Congress 1991 on a bipartisan basis further recognize how this historical tradition of ethical values and principles upon which our great nation was founded have been bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization when they were known as the seven Noahide laws. The American Congress understood how the most recent weakening of this of these principles has resulted in crises that beleaguer and threaten the fabric of civilized society. So now they make it a national crisis if you don't have them. Well, if they mirror the Ten Commandments and we're in this so-called national crisis, then the seven Noahide laws would not make any difference unless, unless radical Talmudists can have the interpretation by the sub-laws that are written not only in the Talmud, but as they write more sub-laws of the enforcement of these laws. That's how they can change it. But it's not for the good of humanity, it's only to silence those that don't agree with what they believe. It is, in essence, uniting not church and state, but radical Talmudism and state. Because we don't have that in our constitution, so therefore you could get away with it, probably. Now, you know, this way gets me to H.W. Bush. Did, did he never read a Bible or something? The guy doesn't know his own Bible. He just blabs out they're part of the Bible when they're not. Thus, they warned us that without these ethical values and principles, the edifice of civilization stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. Public Law 102-14 of the 102nd Congress First Session H. Day Resolution 104. Is there something about, you know, people go, it's not a law, it's not a law. Okay, then why is it called Public Law 102-14? If it's not a law, then why did you call it a law? If it's just a resolution, why did it get called a law? Other world leaders have joined the call for further observance and knowledge of these laws. Examples, only examples, not limited to. Himan van Rompuy, President of the European Union. That covers all the European nations. July 2014, that he uh, seeks greater 
dissemination of the universal laws known as the Noahide laws, and Major General Michael Jeffrey, Governor General of Australia, lamenting family breakdowns and drug and alcohol abuse in modern society in 2008, Letter wrote that he believed that observing the fundamental values of the Noahide laws can be an antidote to such ills of society. The seven, seven Noahide laws don't sp speak about anything about drug and alcohol abuse. I'm sorry, there must be one of those sub-laws. The hundreds of sub-laws that are being written for the Noahide laws that they'll be able to crack down on. Anyway, Dr. Lorraine Day is a trauma surgeon. Uh, it was her husband, former Congressman Bill Dannemeyer. He was one of the signatories on here, but he did not present the bill. And I, maybe, I, maybe I stand corrected on this. He had no idea when these so-called seven Noahide laws were being introduced that there were seven Noahide laws in there. They didn't know anything until this was already signed. All right? So I stand corrected. I don't think he actually signed it per se. But let me read to you a little bit about this. Your U.S. government can, because De, uh, Bill Dannemeyer, former Congress, Congressman Dannemeyer, he actually wrote this. It was published on his wife's website in defense of his not knowing what they were doing. Your U.S. government can now legally kill Christians for the crime of worshiping Jesus Christ. A diabolic deception has been perpetrated on the American people by their own leaders, senators and congressmen who have sold their soul to the devil on March 5, 1991 and the House of Representatives on March 7, 1991 in the U.S. Senate without any knowledge or input by the people of the United States. U.S. senators and congressmen passed a law that is so outrageous and frankly unconstitutional, that it forces the American people to bound by a set of monstrous rules called the Noahide Laws, rules that make the belief in Jesus Christ a crime punishable by decapitation by guillotine. March 20th, 1991, President George H.W. Bush, a supposed Christian, signed the bill into law. Diana notes President George H.W. Bush follows in his father's footsteps. Okay, now I'm going to read to you only the yellow parts here. Still under the same article by Dr. Day on her website. Resolution was introduced design, de designating March 26, 1991 as Education Day USA. It was purposely given this name to deceive the American people. It was in fact double deception because not only did the resolution have nothing to do with education, it was also deceptively billed as a vehicle for recognizing the 89th birthday of Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. But in truth, the resolution was nothing less than a secret, underhanded plot to control the American people by the Noahide laws. Okay? Subterverge for the elimination of Christianity and the elimination of Christians and enslavement of all remaining Gentiles. The resolution, second paragraph, first introduced by minority leader Republican Robert H. Mitchell of Illinois, was referred to the House Post Office and Civil Service Committee in early March 1991. 225 members of the House signed on as co-sponsors for this resolution, but it, highly, but it is highly doubtful they were given the full text of the document. They were probably told only that it was a resolution in honor of Rabbi Schneerson's birthday. Most likely, they had no knowledge that the treacherous Noahide laws were a silent attachment. All right, now, he notes on here, and I don't have it in yellow, I put it right here in white so you could see it easier, I was not one of the co-sponsors. That's Congressman Bill Dannemeyer. He was not one of those sponsors. The committee referred to this resolution to the House for a vote March 5, 1991, but here is where the real treachery begins. The record states that the House of Representatives passed this resolution by unanimous consent. But what the average American does not know is that unanimous consent is a euphemism for getting a bill passed under the radar without almost no one present to vote and with no record of who voted or how they voted. So it's done in secret. And to put it quite bluntly, it did pass. 
And what did they have on there? Let me just get to the right. Congress Mirror. Okay, let's see. One day. Um, I'll, I want to start right down here. One day this resolution was passed. The entire membership of the House of Representatives had already been dismissed after having been told that the day's work, including all the voting, was over. We could all go home. It was then, after virtually all members had left, that the tra traitorous authors of this resolution brought it up for a vote on the House floor. With only four hand-picked members present, it was then deceitfully passed by unanimous consent. On March 5, 1991, by voice vote with almost no one, and there was no record made of their names or how they voted. Two days later, March 7, 1991, the U.S. Senate passed the resolution by voice vote. Also, with no record vote, on March 20, 1991, it was signed by President H.W. Bush and became Public Law 102-14. So it was done very stealthily. First, let's look at Haaretz. This is an opinion piece called the Messianic Zionist Religion whose believers worship Judaism but can't practice it. And that's a very interesting title of an, of, of, of an article on Haaretz because they're talking about evangelicals and even some of the Hebrew, Hebrew Roots movement that are not Jews, they are Gentiles, but they love Israel. They want to, uh, to explore the roots of Judaism. But forgetting about the prophets and what the prophets wrote or what Moses wrote, but instead they're wanting to go under Talmudic law and they have no idea that this is what they're doing. But anyway, the article is interesting. The Noahide Project, which has Israeli governmental and rabbinical support. This is Haaretz. An Israeli newspaper says here, the Noahide Project, which has Israeli governmental and rabbinical support is trying to proselytize members of remote communities just as long as they don't call themselves Jews, right? Wow. Proselyting them. Bringing them in under this covenant of Noahide covenant. Let's read some of the segments of this article. But who are these Noahides? They are members of a new religion subordinate to Judaism, founded by rabbis from Israel, mainly from Chabad and religious Zionist movement. So it's not just Steve. It's not what my wife has said in previous videos in our Steve and Yana chats, which we'll continue on with our chats. We're just dealing with some other issues, as I said before. This is Haaretz. And they're saying there that it is mainly from Chabad and other religious Zionists. And again, maybe not all of them believe the radical side, the Rambam writes, but many of them do. Rabbi Tovia Singer has said publicly, Christians that believe that Jesus is divine and worship Him and pray to Him, they are idolaters. Tovia Singer is a Talmudist. I don't think that Tovia necessarily believes or condones uh, putting people to death. I don't think that he thinks that way. But the thing is, if you really believe Rambam, or do you believe what he said, or do you don't believe what he says? I don't know. I don't know the issue. I can't say who's who in this. But the issue is, they put it in our constitutional laws. All right? According to the World Center, there are dozens of Noahide communities across the world with more than 20,000 believers. They're already forsaking Yeshua as the Messiah. That's a hefty number given that the religion was only founded at the beginning of the decade. Small Noahide communities exist in various countries with the largest one in the Philippines. Yeah, they're, they're already cracking down over there. Cooperation between Israel and the Philippines is constantly growing and this week reached new heights with the visit to Israel. I'm only going to read the, the yellow part, right? Rodrigo Duterte was the, uh, you know, we, you, you see him in the news all the time. He's, he's very vocal. There are four Chabad centers in the country. In addition to assisting Jews, they support 10 Noahide houses of prayer. 
The Hasidic emissaries view the Philippines community as a model for Noahide communities in other countries. A group from the community was brought to Israel two years ago, and its members met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He has also sent his greetings to all the communities worldwide. Well, they tell you right there in the very beginning that what? Which Israeli governmental and rabbinical support so you know Netanyahu is for Noahide laws. And yet we have evangelicals that flock and sing the praises of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Listen, I was there with you at one time. I love Netanyahu. I always, I never believed that he would ever work though. I said it publicly from the very beginning. As much as I loved the man at, the, at one time and I appreciated him at one time, not knowing, and I say that because I was blind to his real purpose, but at one time I was blinded as well in believing that he was for the good of the country. I had no idea that it was only to do the wars to be able to bring about prophecy the way they see it. Netanyahu, like I said, they say that he's supposed to be, Netanyahu is some great guy, but yet he allows the gay parades in Jerusalem. He's the one that signed off on it. He's the one that signed off on the new abortion law in Israel that allows up to third trimester. In other words, the woman could abort the baby all the way up to nine months. And this is supposed to be the, the beliefs of Christianity? It sounds more like the beliefs of what Herod did to those that uh, were, were little bitty children and that they were murdered. And now they even got laws they're wanting to pass that you can take the life of the child after it's born if the mother doesn't want it. What's going on here? Because one of the things that really began to wake me up were things, and I just put a couple of things in here for just, so, just as a reminder to you. What brought me down the road? And what brought us down the road as a family to realize something was wrong? For me, one of the first things that woke me up was the crimes being done against the Syrians, the Christians in Syria, with this financing of the war, blaming Assad for gassing his people when he never gassed his own people. But then what happened next was my wife began to show me, and I have the book sitting here in my office on my bookshelf right here, where Jewish people were writing about the crimes that were being committed by militant Zionists. They want to call Christians militant Christians because they don't want Noahide laws. What about the militant Zionists that were against our own people? Okay? This right here, Zionists sacrificed Jews to the Holocaust, November 1st, 2013. I forget which book this is out of. The world Holocaust is a biblical term for burnt sacrifice. Why, why refer to genocide as a sacrifice? Because the Illuminati bankers deliberately sacrificed European Jews to create the state of Israel, the capital of the Rothschild's occult New World Order. And this book, Perfidy, okay, that's where it's from, it's from the book Perfidy. 1961, author Ben Haidt describes, in which he's a Jew, Ben Haidt was Jewish. He comes from Jewish parents, and his parents were survivors of the Holocaust. They didn't want him to write the book until they read his manuscript before he published it. After they read it, they said, you must publish it with tears in their eyes. Ben Haidt describes how the Nazis lacked the manpower to round up Jews and relied upon Zionists to do it. The Zionists betrayed betrayed their fellow Jews, yet reaped the moral and political capital from the Holocaust. The more Jews died, the stronger the moral case for Israel. The crucial information is not new, but they're trying to dump it down the memory hole. We need to be reminded. Okay? A good friend of mine in Israel wrote me when I began to expose I was using one particular book. Let me, I don't know if I've got it right handy where I can reach out. And re By the way, here's Ben Haidt's book right here. Just so you can see it. Perfidy. Many books written by Jewish authors. Uh, but there's another one, Holocaust Survivors Accused. That was the other book I was thinking about. Where the rabbis talk about how the Hungarian Jews, a million Hungarian Jews, could have been saved. But the Zionist leaders in Switzerland refused to give the three dollars a piece for those Jews that they could have saved. Instead, they spent a thousand dollars a piece only for the elite Zionist 
to be brought out. Well, I thank God they at least saved those. But they spent $1.7 million, which a little bit more money put with that could have got the entire lot of 800,000 Jews that would have been spared from the Holocaust. But if you read these books, you'll find out why. There was a reason behind it. They needed the Holocaust to, to, to justify the creation of the State of Israel. No, we didn't need the Holocaust for that. The Ottoman Empire was already allowing Jewish families to purchase land since the mid-1800s. I think what it was is they didn't want the Sephardic Jews to create the state by diplomatic means. And I think that's where the real issue comes to. I'm kind of winding down here. I'm about out of voice anyway. I want to play for you though, just so you can see the crimes that are done, that are done against others but are done by our own people. This here is from Iran Efrati, an interview I just found recently here on YouTube. Former, he's a former IDF soldier. His father is, a, was, is the, I don't know if he still is the chief of police of Jerusalem or not, but his father is chief of police of Jerusalem. Iran has to live in hiding because of his outspoken views of what really goes on. Listen to what he says here. I realized that my job is actually to maintain an apartheid system. Very, uh, very early on, I understood that the rights that the Jewish settlers have are not the rights that the Palestinians have. I understood that I cannot touch a Jewish settler if he is attacking a Palestinian. The best I can do is call a local police department to come handle it, like I would do at home in Jerusalem. So these Jewish settlers that live in Hebron are living under the same rights that I live in, in Jerusalem, but a Palestinian next to them, next house over, next building over, sometimes next apartment over, lives under my rule, my military rule. And I can do whatever I want with him. I can take his home as a temporary base for a few hours to a few days to a few weeks. I can decide that I'm arresting the people of the house and tying them up to defense of my base. Um, if you will get an order to demolish their home or just lock their front door and don't let them out into the street their house is on a street that only Jewish settlers can walk on and Palestinians cannot so they have to walk through windows to yards into the other side into the castle of Hebron I think realizing all of that in a very very early stage in my service helped me understood that someone was lying to me along the way I didn't feel like I'm protecting anyone. I didn't feel like I'm helping anyone feel more safe. I feel like I'm terrorizing people. I feel like for the first time in my life, the boundaries between good and bad that I learned as a kid, and obviously I learned that I'm on the good side, I was broken. I felt like I am the terrorist. And my job was literally to scare people so they cannot think about acting against these early settlers or these early military. That was actually our defined mission, to make sure that to instill fear in the hearts of Palestinians in Hebron. And that's exactly what we did. Imagine that. And Iran Efrati I realize is one of many soldiers that have come out and testified to these things. When I lived in Jerusalem back in 2004, I had a roommate. They lived with me in a house. We had a private house there uh, up in Givet Hamivitar, uh, which is in northern Jerusalem, close to Hebrew University. And he as well told me, shared with me of the atrocities that soldiers would do, pra target practice on Palestinians. And he confessed to me that he'd killed many Palestinians as an Israeli soldier. Now, I don't think that all Israeli soldiers participate in these type things. But the thing is, what you hear from Iran Afrati is nothing unusual. Yours is a voice of criticism we don't often hear in the United States. Um, often when there is dissent expressed in the United States against policies of the Israeli government, um, uh, 
people here are called anti-Semitic. Uh, what is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? Well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe somebody is criticizing Israel, then we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country people are criticizing Israel, then they are anti-Semitic. And the organization is strong and has a lot of money. And the, the ties between uh, Israel and the American esta Jewish establishment are very strong. And they are strong in this country. As you know, uh, they have power, which it's okay. They are talented people and they have power, money, and uh, media, and other things. And their attitude is, Israel, my country, right or wrong, the identification. And they are not ready to hear criticism. And it's very easy to blame people who criticize certain acts of the Israeli government as anti-Semitics and to bring up the Holocaust and the suffering of the Jewish people. And that's, that justify everything we do to the Palestinians. Since Judaism is very much a religion of its literature, we need to go where its most sacred teachings are preserved. We need to go to a synagogue, in particular, the library of a synagogue. In every synagogue library, we find hundreds of books, but there are a few which tower above the rest in authority. These include the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, the Jewish Encyclopedia. In the oldest of these, the Jewish Encyclopedia, we encounter fascinating new perspectives on the inner teachings of Judaism, perspectives which are well known to most religious Jews, but unknown to Christians. Most Christians believe that the Judaism of the Old Testament is very similar to Judaism today. Yet the Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on Judaism, says modern Judaism and the Judaism of the Old Testament are very different. It says that after Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah in the 6th century BC and led the Jews to distant Babylon, the Jews were faced with challenges to their faith they had never before experienced. Ever since the time of Solomon, the religion of Israel had centered around the magnificent temple in Jerusalem with its sacrifices and rituals. The question now became, how could one be a true Jew in a very foreign, even hostile environment? The need arose for a certain class of lay priests called scribes or sophurim to interpret the law in this new setting and make it workable. In time, these scribes became what the New Testament calls the scribes and Pharisees, the greatest legal authorities of Israel for all ages. The Pharisees said there were really two inspired revelations to the Jews. There was the written law of Moses received atop Sinai, but there was also the oral tradition acquired by 70 elders who came to the base of the mountain but were forbidden to proceed farther. The Pharisees said that these 70 elders, or Sanhedrin, received a much more extensive and profound revelation than Moses, a revelation which was never written down yet took precedent over the written law. When Jesus came on the scene, his reaction was to bitterly denounce this counterfeit tradition. Christ said the Pharisees, by their tradition, had made the law of God of none effect. He considered the Pharisees the most dangerous leadership Israel ever had. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Although Jewish sects such as the Sadducees now disappeared, the Pharisees emerged with even greater power over the Jewish people. The Jewish Encyclopedia describes the new role of the Pharisees. With the destruction of the temple, the Sadducees disappeared altogether, leaving the regulation of all Jewish affairs in the hands of the Pharisees. Henceforth, Jewish life was regulated by the Pharisees. The whole history of Judaism was reconstructed from the Pharisaic point of view. Pharisaism shaped the character of Judaism and the life and thought of the Jew for all of the future. In 135 AD, all Jews were expelled from Palestine. The Pharisees led most Palestinian Jews in a mass migration back to Babylon. The majority of Jews were already in Babylon and had been since the time of Nebuchadnezzar 600 years earlier. 
Yet around 140 A.D., Babylon became the acknowledged land of refuge for world Jewry. For another thousand years, Judaism flourished in Babylon under the leadership of the Pharisees. Great academies of the rabbis were established and thousands of new laws formulated. There, those same Pharisees who killed Jesus Christ remained the undisputed rulers of Judaism. In Babylon, the Pharisees codified their oral traditions into the Babylonian Talmud, the written form of that oral tradition which Jesus so bitterly rebuked. The Talmud reveals how deep was Israel's apostasy. In her beginning, God gave the Hebrews the loftiest, the most upright literature and ethics the world has ever known. Yet when they turned their backs on him, they produced the Talmud, a work which has aptly been called a monument to human folly. The Talmud also helps us understand the basis for Christ's unflattering descriptions of the Pharisees. Jesus described the Pharisees as hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. He even described the Pharisees as children of their father the devil, a murderer from the beginning. The Talmud confirms Christ's words. In the Talmud, in Treatise Sanhedrin, an extensive passage describes the right of the Pharisee to kill anyone, just as long as he did so indirectly. As one of dozens of examples, the Talmud tells us that if one bound his neighbor and he died of starvation, he is not liable to execution. In such an indirect manner, the Pharisees also killed Christ. Manipulating the Romans to actually wield the spear and sword, the Pharisees claimed, as their descendants do today, that since the Romans were the direct cause of the death of Christ, it is the Romans, not the Jews, who are guilty. Christ also called the Pharisees adulterers, an adulterous generation. The Talmud provides generous loopholes for adultery. It says the penalty for adultery does not include sex with a minor, the wife of a minor, or the wife of a heathen. The Talmud also encourages seduction of unwed adolescent girls called designated bondmaids. But it's important how such rapes are performed. With the designated bondmaid, one is guilty only in the case of natural connection, but not in the case of perverse connection. The Pharisees reason that rape in a perverted manner is outside the jurisdiction of the law. Normal rape, however, was punishable. In Babylon, sexual perversion of every kind had been a way of life for millenniums. The Pharisees were deeply influenced by such practices. In three of the major treatises of the Talmud are found extensive passages which give legal endorsement to seduce and marry three-year-old baby girls. In fact, many of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, including Simeon ben Yohai, upheld this privilege. Today in Israel, thousands of Jews go to Meron every year to venerate the memory of Simeon ben Yohai, one of the most respected rabbis in the history of Judaism. In one of dozens of endorsements of child sex, Simeon ben Yohai said, A proselyte under the age of three years and a day is permitted to marry a priest. Agreeing with ben Yohai, the great rabbi said, When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. For when the girl is less than this, three years and a day, it is as if one put the finger into the eye. The footnote to this passage says, As tears come to the eye again and again, so does virginity come back to the little girl under three years. The same section confirms that sexual activity with small boys is in the same category. The intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. In addition to adulterers, Christ, in the story of the Good Samaritan, portrayed the Pharisees as racial bigots too self-righteous to respond to the suffering of one who was not a Jew. It is true because of the wickedness of the Canaanites, which included sodomy and infant sacrifice, Israel had been commanded by God to be harsh in her treatment of the inhabitants of the land. God made it clear that the Canaanites were not simply to be avoided, but destroyed. By the time of the New Testament, this method of preserving God's kingdom by separation and the sword had become obsolete. God no longer made a racial difference between men. 
But the Pharisees were unfazed by God's new agenda. The Talmud was finally written down nearly five centuries after Christ, yet its critical, even homicidal attitudes toward Gentiles might have been lifted out of the book of Joshua. However, the quickest way to grasp the Talmudic view of Gentiles is not directly from the Talmud, but from the Jewish encyclopedias. If we quote an isolated opinion from the Talmud, a rabbi may quickly object, saying, but that is not the overall opinion of the Talmud. That is not the definitive view. What the Jewish encyclopedia provides us is a definitive overview of perhaps hundreds of rabbinic statements on any subject, giving us accurate summaries of what the Talmud generally teaches. In its article on Gentiles, the Jewish encyclopedia begins to define what makes a Jew so different from a Gentile. According to the rabbis, only Israelites are men. Gentiles they class not as men, but as barbarians. Since Gentiles are not men in the fullest sense, so the Gentile is not a neighbor of a Jew. Further, since Gentile laws were too crude to admit of reciprocity, meaning too crude to be taken seriously, the Gentile was forever beneath the Jew. Gentiles were outlawed by God from the beginning and thus had no property rights. The Almighty offered the Torah to the Gentile nations also, but since they refused to accept it, he withdrew his shining legal protection from them and transferred their property rights to Israel, who observed his law. Since the Talmud outlawed the child, or issue of a Gentile, as that of a beast, a Gentile had as little legal rights in a Jewish court as did an animal. The Talmud states that if a Gentile sue an Israelite, the verdict is for the defendant, the Israelite. Conversely, if the Israelite is the plaintiff, he obtains full damages. Because the Talmud conspires against Gentiles, if a Jew was ever caught telling a Gentile what the Talmud really says, such a person deserves death. So vile was the nature of a Gentile that the great Simeon ben Yohai said, the best among the Gentiles deserves to be killed. The best of snakes ought to have its head crushed. Jews, however, are exalted beings in the Talmud, worthy of praise. Christ described the Pharisee who blessed himself, saying, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not as other men. An eminent Talmudic rabbi says the same. Blessed be thou who hast not made me a goy or Gentile. There is a special antagonism between the Talmud and Jesus. The Talmud attacks him everywhere it can, even his mother. Mary, the Talmud says, was a whore who mated with carpenters. She who was the descendant of princes and governors played the harlot with carpenters. It naturally followed that the scribes declared Christ to be a bastard. In its article on Jesus, the Jewish encyclopedia says that Jewish writings defame Christ. It is the tendency of all these sources to belittle the person of Jesus by ascribing to him illegitimate birth, magic, and a shameful death. Jesus, according to this article, was considered one of the three worst enemies of Judaism who came to an ignoble end. The Talmud says they subjected him to four deaths, stoning, burning, decapitation, and strangling. The Talmud also says he is now in hell, punished with boiling hot excrement. What is Christ's advice as he speaks to us out of hell? The Jewish encyclopedia quotes Jesus as telling us above all to bless the Jews. He says, Further their well-being, do nothing to their detriment. Whoever touches them touches even the apple of his eye. Christians, as followers of the false prophet Jesus, also deserve death. The Jewish encyclopedia again recaps the Talmud's position. A Gentile observing the Sabbath deserves death. It says the Talmud's hatred was probably directed against the Christian Jews. These Judeo-Christians, evasively called Min, Minit, or Minim, were considered by the rabbis to be the most dangerous form of heretics of ancient times. The New Testament Gospels were writings which the rabbis considered more dangerous to the unity of Judaism than those of the pagans. A Talmudic rabbi said, the writings of Christians deserve to be burned 
for paganism is less dangerous than minute or Christianity. The Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on men, continues to illustrate the Talmudic hatred of Christianity. Again, we must remember, minim usually indicates the Judeo-Christians. It was forbidden to partake of meat, bread, or wine with the Christian. Scrolls of the law, Tefillin, and Mezuzot, written by a Christian, were burned. An animal slaughtered by a Christian was forbidden food. The relatives of the Christian were not permitted to observe the laws of mourning after his death, but were required to assume festive garments and rejoice. The testimony of a Christian was not admitted in evidence in Jewish courts, and an Israelite who found anything belonging to one who was a Christian was forbidden to return it to him. The Pharisees, through their Talmud, thus gave the Jews an ethic which encouraged bigotry and isolation. And Hashem wrote in the Torah like this, And goyim kemar midli, ukeshachak moznaim nechshavu. Translation, the difference between a Jew to a Goy, to a non-Jew, and we are talking now even the most righteous Goy, not an idol worshiper, a great gentile person, great personality, loving Jew, respecting God, everything fine with him. But this is a Jew compared to him, according to the book of God. The Jew is like the water that you bring from the lake in the bucket. And the Gentile is the few drops that stick to the side of the bucket when you put it down. And the second comparison is When you go to the market to buy vegetables, in many countries, in Israel it's still like this until this moment, you tell him, give me one kilo of cucumbers, which is about 10 pieces. So what does he have? He has a mechanical scale, not electronic. Some places they already have electronic, but he has this old-fashioned mechanical scale, and he has a weight that is 1,000 gram, it's one kilo, 2.2 pound. He put it on one side, and then he begins to put cucumbers on the other side. Once the scale is balanced, he put it in a bag, he pay him, and that's the end of it. Hashem say, you know what's the difference between you, the Jew, to a non-Jew? You are the weight for me, and he is the one gram that fall over the ears to the side. Which means, if you take the weight that's supposed to be a thousand gram and you put it in a precise electronic scale, very, very, you know, a precise scale, it's never gonna be a thousand gram. Right, 999, 997. Over the years, the corners are rubbing off. It's one gram after one ear, another gram after two ears. After a few years, it may be 990 grams. But no customer care about this one or two grams. What is it, another little piece of the cucumber? Nobody cares. It's a thousand grams, a thousand grams, 997, fine. Let me go, don't waste my time. This is what Hashem say. You are the weight for me. He is the little piece who fell on the floor that nobody cares. And you want to be him? Right 
present, you'll have to come around behind and not assign it since we're squeezing in so close. All right, we'll bring the still photographers. teachings of the laboratories really have as much relevance today as they ever have. The values on which the movement is based, wisdom and reverence, are not just desirable, but necessary for the very survival of, of civilization. And now we shall proclaim this day, education day. His regards to you, Mr. President, that he expresses his wishes as he always did, that he should be able to carry out the extraordinary role that the Almighty has assigned to you, as you have until now, with help and happiness together with the First Lady for many years to come. In whatever position you'll be filling, we all look forward to you to continue the great work, historical work that you have started on behalf of education, specifically by returning the traditional values which have been the bedrock of civilization ever since beginning. And these are the seven no white laws contained and given by Moses as it is reflected here in this scroll. We thank you very much on behalf of all our colleagues, of the entire Jewish people, especially with the approach of the Passover holiday throughout the world. Thank you.